Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog 166, video for PhD students. Uh, this vlog comes via request from Todd. Todd, at this point I'm going to have to put you on some sort of retainer, but let me show you how we got here. As my wonderful Flinders students know, I send a weekly email to the PhD and Research Master students at Flinders. Yes, it's a way to send them the link to the video that I record every week for them, but also it's a way for me to show any interesting moments and movements that are happening in international research. And one week, I explored and talked about a really interesting new innovation in academic life, and that is the Academic Video Journal. The Video Academic Journal. And Todd immediately wrote back to me and said, look, that's incredibly interesting. I'm really interested in that. Could we do something more broadly about the role of video or what video can do for a PhD student? And I thought that was brilliant, let's have a go. But on that same day, one of our great students in biology wrote to me and she said, look, when I got the email this morning, I thought, oh, I wonder if that video journal is more for arts crew and the humanities people. And then she thought about it and she realised how incredibly visual biology research is. And she said, look, this is important to me. I would love to express my research in a different way. Could you help us and talk through the video journal a bit more? So fantastic. And she was absolutely right, by the way. There are more academic video journals in the sciences than there are in the humanities and some of the really heavyweight corporate publishers are moving into this field moving into this area now but video for PhD students is a hell of a lot more than simply the academic journals these new video academic journals so what I've done is I've picked five possible areas of video dissemination for your research for our PhD students. So there are five very different ways, and so for all of you, the diversity of PhD students out there, this may just help you find a new channel to disseminate and probe and explore and develop your work. And the time is right, absolutely right, to be having this vlog, and I'll tell you why. The Office of Graduate Research has just bought a fantastic video camera, a Zoom video camera, and Zoom audio recorder for the use of our PhD students. So you can come in, loan the kit, and go and do fabulous things with it. So yes, come on down into the Office of Graduate Research, sign away, borrow the kit for a period, and have a bit of a play with it. That's great. And can I say video is probably best explored in this way, having a bit of a play, seeing what you can do. Because video can be quite challenging. Look, I find it quite challenging. A lot of you know my day job, my research for really the last 20, 25 years has been in sonic media, sound, auditory culture, popular music. And when I took on this job at Flinders University, I thought, what would I find really, really difficult to do? And I thought, well, like, like a, a weekly video, it'd be pretty tough. Maybe I could have a go with that to test myself and try and learn new things. And the reason I think that visual media is so important, video platforms are so important, is they're very engaging. So I decided on vlogs, videos, because so many of our students exist outside of Adelaide. And I thought it was important once a week, all those amazing students see me once a week and we build a relationship. And there's a reason why video particularly has that connection, that relationship. If you think about it, all our senses gather information for us. Touch, taste, smell, our hearing, but also vision. But visual media and visual modes of communication are our most developed information sources. And they dominate all other sensory experiences. Why? And of course, we have that cliche seeing is believing, yeah? And that means what happens is, because our visual literacy is so highly developed, we tend to lose or de-emphasize the other sensory material that we engage with in our life. So that may be hearing, it may be touch, it may be taste. And visuality tends to dominate other signs. There was a great book written by David Howes, H-O-W-E-S, and he called it the empire of the senses. And the argument was that visuality colonizes 
other sources. And through formal schooling, through schools and our universities, we are taught visual literacy. We are taught to read. We are taught to write. And indeed in art classes, we've taught to develop and understand pictorial and illustrative elements as well. So visual literacy is taught. The other literacies are less so. Therefore, the commonsensical literacy in our culture, the popular cultural literacy in our culture, is visual. So therefore, it's pretty important if you want profile, if you want to be known, then visuality creates that connection with an audience. And look, it also has huge advantages. Through YouTube, we have a window to the greatest scholars in the world. Historically, there's so much incredible material, archival material there for us to see from the great scholars. But also, content creation allows you as a PhD student to disseminate your work, to punch above your weight and avoid or go around or outside the gatekeepers who attempt to control your discipline. And then of course once you've got that material on YouTube you can repost it and triangulate it through a range of social media sources. And the tech now is really really straightforward. You can enter this sphere with a tripod your mobile phone can do the job to record video these days or a really low priced but high quality camera like the Zoom video. And it takes me, and I'm not exaggerating here, 30 seconds to set up these vlogs each week. There's a tripod, whack the camera on, test it, on we go. And that allows me then to focus very strongly on just doing good content for you. I then go home, edit it on Movie Maker and load it up to YouTube on Friday and Saturday nights. But there's lots of options available. But if you want a sort of baseline entry here, go for a tripod, a zoom camera and Movie Maker and you are then on your way. So what I'm going to do is present five options or five genres, if you will, for the creation of video for you and your research. So wherever you are in your career, whatever your comfort zone with presenting yourself on video, and I really get that, wherever you are on this, let me provide some options for you to play, to explore, to challenge. So the five options are, we're going to have a quick chat about the video abstract for an article. We're going to look at the video article itself. We're going to do photo story and digital storytelling, flipped teaching, flipped training, and also vlogging. So let's get into this. These are five options for you. Boom. Let's start with the video abstract. Now I've done a whole vlog on the video abstract, which I believe it was vlog 66. Today is 166. I didn't plan it, but there you go. So if you want a whole presentation on the video abstract, then go to vlog 66. But let me just get into the party here and say why the video abstract matters as the first stage in your video journey. It's a great place to start. It's a great place to teach yourself how to operate with video. Why? Well, firstly, the answer is it is short. A video abstract for your article operates between three and five minutes. So that's quite important because with that short amount of time you can learn how to use a camera. You don't have to concentrate on a huge amount of content. You can simply deliver it, control your voice and start to learn how to use video. You don't have to sustain it over a longer period of time, which is of course much harder. So what is a video abstract? Really easy. It is the video equivalent of a written abstract. It is an emerging genre and it is increasingly being used by corporate publishers uh, because of what it can do for your journal article. So what is it? Right length, three to five minutes. It provides an overview for prospective readers about what your research is about. It does it at speed, so it doesn't need to be long. It must be about three to five minutes because what it's doing is it's helping viewers understand your research and see if it is of relevance to them, see if they're interested in it and if they're interested in the results of the research. It's also though a way to lift your citations incredibly quickly. There was a 2014 study that showed only 5% of refereed articles have a video abstract but it lifts up the citation of those articles by 25 to 30 percent. 
So get in there. So what, what's the focus on? How do you structure the video abstract? Well, firstly, the rationale for the study, why you did it. Two, the methods, how you did it. And finally, the implications of the research implications of the research, what it means. The goal is to connect that research to a reader, connect it up, and therefore you have to be clear, and this is a really good and important skill for you to gain, you have to be really clear about who is the audience for that research, and is it other academics, is it policy work, is it translational research, and when you make that decision, that determines the language you deploy in the video abstract. So where do we see the best uses of video abstract? Particularly I would argue in the sciences but also engineering because video abstracts allow the visualisation of the research, incredibly important. For the humanities and the social sciences, I think video abstracts are incredibly useful in explaining the applications of the research, so why the research matters. Video abstracts allow you to make an article special and lift it above the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of articles that appear every single week. The best video abstracts are included in the written article. So it goes right, this is what it's about, but it also enables it to move media. So it is visual, you're not just simply reading the abstract. It's structured slightly differently. And a range of great journals are using video abstracts well. I draw you particularly to physics education. I think that's the best deployment of video abstracts that we're seeing at the moment, physics education. And let's just go through the publishers that are doing this. Elsevier, Wiley, Taylor and Francis have their own Vimeo channel. And also, of course, the wonderful Emerald, my publishers, are going strongly in this area as well. Wiley have, wow, have they committed to the video abstract. And they described it as, quote, bringing research to life bringing research to life. So if you want to do a video abstract, this is how you start. This is the easiest place to start. Start simply. Camera, tripod, thanks for playing. Keep it simple. Three minutes directly delivered to a camera. Script it. Do not speak off the cuff and work out your key structure. And guys, if you just want a structure, start off with introduce yourself. Who are you? Start with your name then go to the title of the paper. So bang, bang, thanks for playing. Then present the important information first. What you've discovered, why should the audience care, and who should read this work. Do not, as we say in journalism, do not bury the lead. Put the most important bit, the discovery, the outcome, the most important bit, whack it right to the front of the video abstract. If it's an empirical piece, tell us about your data set, tell us about your interpretation, explain how what you've discovered can transform knowledge. Similarly with a theoretical piece, explain how that research changes our thinking on a particular topic. And again, your goal is to connect that research with either a group of scholars or a group of practitioners. Can I also say, and this is crucial, I've been watching this movement this year, conferences are increasingly using video abstracts. So this is a conference abstract. And I've been monitoring BASES 19, and that's the BASES 19 conference in sport and exercise science. And wow, they're doing it well. So put in BASES 19, you can see what these conference video abstracts are looking like. So how great is this? Before you go to a conference, you get to have a look at the research and have a look at the researcher and see if it's worth your time. Can I also say for a lot of years, in fact, probably a decade and a half, I've done, I didn't know it was called an abstract, but I was doing introductions to keynote presentations and special presentations I've done around the world. I've actually just done a two minute introduction to that talk as a way to say where it is and what I'm doing. So as you can see, the video abstract is working strongly for articles, for conferences, and also keynotes and special seminars you're gonna do. If you do nothing else, have a go at this area. So let's go to number two, the video article. Now, this is a completely different box of dice. I'm currently working on a video article. And can I just say, just personally, it's changing. 
changing radically the way I think about research, how I present research, how I organise a script. It, it's fascinating for me at my age to have to think about how we reconfigure research. It's really powerful. I'm loving it. So this is a fascinating area for you to think about earlier on in your career. Now, the video article exists from the high humanities right the way through to the hard sciences. So every discipline is now opting into this party. There's no discipline that's gone, oh, look, that's not a thing for me. So this is big. This is important. Firstly, there's also a, a meta genre in this area. Uh, there's best seen, I think, in the video journal of machine learning. Oh, I love this. The video journal of machine learning. And that allows researchers, wherever they might have published an article, to just front a camera and go, hi, this is the research I'm doing in machine learning. You need to have a look at this. And here's the link to the article, or the research, or the methodology, or a data set. So this is really a meta journal. If you are interested in machine learning, you go there first. And it's great to see the researchers talk about their research in a really engaging way. It's brilliant. So that's sort of the meta part of this conversation. But the nested video articles in nested video journals is just simply remarkable. Because I think we need to justify our commitment, what we're doing in our research, and I think why a lot of the publishers have gone into it is they wanted visual data sets to gain the emphasis and the priority that they deserve. They recognise, these corporate publishers, the benefits of sharing particular areas of research and research findings visually that will also increase the access to that research. So the journals that are working very strongly in this area to seek out uh, the Journal of Minimally Invasive Gynaecology. Can I say, sorry to be sort of slightly crude, but isn't it great at sort of minimally invasive gynaecology that's being talked about in a video journal rather than other sorts of gynaecology, but that's just me. But also Fungal Genetics and Biology. Fascinating journal, that one. Really interesting in terms of presenting visual data sets. Amazing. And also the Urology Video Journal. Again, excellent. These journal articles, they pass through refereeing as normal. So they pass through the peer review process that is the basis of academic life. Important. But then they're reviewed in terms of form. So they're curated as video. Wow. Now, newer publishers are moving into this space and really doing some amazing stuff. And of course, I have to mention Jove here. J O. V -E. Jove describes their project as, quote, we change the way science is done. End of quote. Thanks for playing. They currently house all their video articles in www.jove.com. And what's there? 10,187 videos video articles as of yesterday. So for the lab-based sciences, the video article is about reproducibility, it's about showing experimental results. Researchers can follow your experiments and really this is changing the way in which science is reported. So what are the strengths of the video article? Well, figures and illustrations suddenly come to life and can be explored in a really engaging way. And also they're pretty easy to create. They do vary. There's some quite straightforward ones and some complicated ones. But Jove often goes straight into researchers' laboratories and, and films right there. So it's amazing. It also builds outreach to other researchers, but also to government and you know, my particular politics. It means that the taxpayers who pay for our research can actually see it. And for me, that's a really good thing. And also feedback is much faster. There are disadvantages. There are lots of different ways of presenting research and not all research, not all projects are best presented visually. Uh, there's no hard copy of the article and the raw data is not easily reviewed and viewed. I think there are ways to mitigate and manage that, but they are challenges currently. But for the presentation of methods, wow. The presentation of outputs or results, wow. The changes for us as researchers, I think, is enormous here. But for you as a researcher, just start to learn these skills. Get comfortable with yourself 
and video and conveying your research. And you're going to be ahead of the game here, ahead of the curve. This is an exciting time. Wow, it is. Trialing whole new ways of thinking about research. And as I said, all disciplines are involved here, all disciplines. Hard science appears to be dominating, but we've also got the European Journal of Media Studies in my sort of field, and also the Journal of Embodied Research. And wow, some interesting stuff's happening there. Right the way through, of course, the experimental sciences, and Elsevier has dug in and committed deeply here. So let's con continue the video story. We've done the two most obvious bits. Let's go to three, digital storytelling. Digital storytelling is beautiful. I love digital storytelling because it's a combination of old and new media. And say you're very comfortable with still images. I know a lot of our great researchers out there take their own photographs. You send me a lot of them and they are remarkable. So if you are comfortable with still images, let's create a bit of moving image around it. So this is how you start with photography and you create a really special form of research dissemination. Digital storytelling uses photographs to tell the tale, the research arc of your scholarship. What happens is photographs are ordered. They're put in a series, often with a voiceover from an academic. Sometimes there's a soundtrack, I think it's better with a voiceover. And then from those two components, they're amalgamated in the software and they become a digital story. Basically, this is a slideshow on steroids. Digital storytelling videos, again, are short. They're under five minutes, and they start with an idea. What are we trying to express here? And then the photographs are placed, or images, are placed in a particular order, and then the voiceover configures the narrative of those images. Once the visuals have been selected and ordered, that voiceover is written, again, very straightforward, 500 words maybe, 750 words, that's your narrative. And the scripts are then recorded on an MP3 file. Some really nifty software is deployed that puts it all together. The choices are Microsoft Photo Story, which really started off the whole genre. It's easy to use, intuitive, the results are excellent, and it's free, always good. I use Magic, and it's M-A-G-I-X, Magic. Photo story. This is a bit of paid software, but it is better, I think, than the Microsoft version. But look, have a go with the freebie first, see if you like it. But I think the templates that are used in Magic are actually pretty good and worth the money I'm paying. So what both bits of software do is they meld the photographs beautifully in the order you've presented them and then align the soundtrack so it floats around the images. This is great. This is a real DIY enterprise. It allows you to take photographs, which I think is important for research visually. You need to take photographs, you do, so that you're not reliant on copyrighted images, particularly in our present with all the IP stuff going on. Really, you start taking pictures. You start taking pictures and use them in diverse ways. And as I've always said, you know, academics at our best. I hope all of us are storytellers. How did you decide on your research area? How did it happen? What happened and why does it matter? That narrative arc is incredibly well expressed through digital storytelling. Particularly, I think, the motivations for you doing this research are well conveyed here. So if photographs are your thing, then go for this mode of visuality. I really understand a lot of you going, I just don't want to see myself. I just don't want to see myself on video. I think that all the time too. But if you don't want to see yourself on video, then think about alternative visual modes and digital storytelling is one of them. Four, flipped teaching, learning, professional development. Video is such a useful platform to experiment with because an array of teaching and learning and professional development opportunities are now bubbling in and through video. So once you're comfortable with delivering content to video, so particularly through the abstract, say, then flipped teaching and learning, flipped professional development is probably the next stage. 
flipped learning is a mode of instruction that delivers content outside of the conventional classroom. But then what happens is when scholars come back together in that classroom, they take that flipped content as read and it creates a much more interactive, collaborative and applicable teaching and learning vibe. This is a student focused strategy because what happens is that flipped video content is sharp, it's intense, but it then fits into the life of the student. Then that face-to-face -face time is much better deployed, applying the ideas so the differentiated instruction is then possible and time is spent in face-to-face -face environments, not dealing with content, but making the content meaningful. I think it's good. So the video skills that you're gaining through that journal article abstract or the video article itself can be then transferred into the teaching environment and also of course the training context. Now I know a lot of you out there are exploring consultancy opportunities for your future so flipped professional development is going to be a really big area. Producing video content that's watched before the session and then sharing the interactive session that creates space for application and collaboration. So these videos, particularly when housed on a YouTube channel, brand you, sell your wares, show to the world what you can do. So remember, flipped teaching and learning changes everything about teaching and learning. The early experiments in flipped teaching and learning were poor because people sort of um, recorded a lecture. <laughs> and you don't do that. It's a different way of, of configuring nuggets of content and delivering it in an engaged and really sharp way. Remember, the written script has to be very carefully configured before you record a video and most flipped learning is about 10 to 15 minutes of content. That's about right. So once you've had a go at the video abstract, this is probably the next stage to have a go with your use of video in your research, teaching, learning and professional development. Okay, five, vlogging. Now I've presented this vlog on video uh, in a relatively straightforward order. So you could actually develop your skills starting with the simplest, the video abstract, and moving through in degree of difficulty. But I did want to finish with vlogging because vlogging could be the easiest strategy for you or it could actually be the hardest depending on who you are and your relationship with a camera and your relationship with how you present yourself in space. Vlogging is a visual form of blogging. Blogging emerged in the late 1990s, 1999, 2000 as the first moment of social media where people would write short pieces, write reflections, write journalism without editors outside of newspapers and magazines without gatekeepers to control their writing. And they were free to express themselves, free to find an audience or in most cases not find an audience. And vlogging is similar. It is a direct mode of expression, saying what you want to say, finding an audience or not finding an audience. Now I intentionally, when I started this party, I called this a vlog series and I did that intentionally. Not a video series, but a vlog series because I wanted to access that informality of blogging. That, you know, I literally, as I move around the world, I land in a place, I land in Macau, land in the UK somewhere, and I just set up my tripod, set up my camera, and you get to meet really interesting people in a relaxed and engaging fashion. Also, I wanted to create a diversity of times and places where we could have blogs that would be I suppose appropriate to the content because the thing about blogs and vlogging is there's a diversity of length so I could you know some of the vlogs have been 15 minutes I think one was 45 minutes so the content the topic determined the length and I think if I'd gone into other modes it would have been much more prescriptive in terms of the length and how I present the content vlogs are cool it's conversational we're having a chat you know wherever I am we're having a chat and I think that's an interesting way of presenting content so the form fits the content. Also they are informal and can allow you as a researcher to again find all sorts of different audiences outside of the other options I've presented today. So diverse in genre, diverse in content, diverse in length, informal. Now a lot of PhD students around the world vlog and why it's useful to you 
is it allows you to reflect on the process of doing a PhD. And as we've talked about so often, the students that finish not only do good research, but they reflect on the process of doing a PhD. So vlogging or blogging or even journaling in the privacy of your own home are all great strategies to think about your PhD while you're doing a PhD. Now it's free and easy to set up a YouTube channel, get a camera, get a tripod and talk about your research. Talk about your PhD, talk about your teaching, talk about how you're feeling through the process of doing this degree. And you will find an audience. PhD media is a very interesting part of social media and it is a way to disseminate your results quickly, find feedback, meet new people, to share that experience of doing a PhD. That's a great communication system. So video doesn't have to be this frightening interface or this frightening platform. Absolutely you could move through your academic career without using video. Now it's funny I wrote that in the script when I was going through it this morning for the last time, I thought, I wonder if that's actually true now. That for you guys, can you move through your career without having any expertise in video, in teaching and learning and research? And you know what? I'm not sure. 20 years ago, yeah, now I'm uncertain. But one thing I do know for sure is that this is a great series of skills for you to develop that prepares you for all sorts of media appearances and expert commentaries. And we want that. We want your research to travel. We want it to be known. It's always beneficial, I think, to learn those skills that allow your research to move through space and time. And the great thing about just having a bit of an experiment at this point is you can make lots and lots of mistakes and no one ever has to see it, but you'll learn all sorts of different professional opportunities and pathways to express your ideas. And through today's session you can see whatever you're comfortable with, there's a strategy going forward. If you take fantastic photographs, as so many of you do, digital storytelling is the way forward. Short, sharp content through a video abstract. Do that. If you do nothing else, have a good go for two minutes. Get your research out. Or do this truly remarkable new genre that's emerging with the video article. It really is changing how we think about the structuring of research, so powerful. But you can also simply reflect on a process through a vlog, an experimental space where you can brand yourself and find new audiences and of course then displace those skills, move those skills into teaching and learning through flipped training. Brilliant. So pick what you're good at, develop up those skills and add a video dimension to your research to your work, to your life. And remember, the OGR has free kit in the office for you to use. This is a cheap thing to get into and it's free if you borrow our kit. So we hope that you will. So I hope that's useful, Todd. You rock, Todd. And I wish you all love, light and peace. Tea out.